Okay, hello everybody. This is Ronaldo Magernian, um, the one of the, the creators of the Break RPG, and I'm playing uh, Crystallis today, uh, or as it's known in Japan, Godslayer. Um, but you can probably guess as to why they did not keep that title in, um, in when they brought it over here in 1990. Um, but yeah, this was a favorite of mine as a, actually not quite as a kid, well as a kid, but um, I actually got it a little later than normal. Um, I did not uh, get this on date of release. I think I maybe gotten it a little after my family got a Super Nintendo. Um, and that was because as soon as that came out, you would find a lot of uh, NES games on sale for, for cheap, or at least cheaper than they were before. And I, it was easy for me to convince uh, my parents to grab this one for me as a gift because I thought it sounded very cool and I was correct. Um, anyway, as you can see from the intro that goes by, uh, this game takes place after an apocalypse of sorts. Um, the <laughs> an apocalypse that's supposed to happen in 1997. Um, you know, when I... Uh, I, I think that's a lesson to all of us that maybe when if you're doing a game that's supposed to be take place in the future, set your dates very far in the future. Uh, yeah, Food Dinner makes a good point. It does explain a lot. Um, 1997 was a pretty eventful year, probably. Um, I don't remember too much about it. Yeah, 2000XX is the year of choice. Anyway, we're going to let's start. Oh. oh, my controller's being funny. Well, give me one second. Now let's just go ahead. There we go. Oh no. Well, this is embarrassing. Gray already made fun of me, saying I would I would mess up something, and I was thinking I would mess up the. Um, give me one moment, actually. Gonna turn this off. There we go. Gonna turn this off for a second and just talk to you guys normally. So, unfortunately, I wanted to hook this up to. Um, regular hardware uh, with a with a capture card, um, but. Unfortunately, I don't have the capture card I wanted to get is a little pricey and I just had to pay for breaks. So, ha. Huh. There we go. And so I have to do emulation. Though I can assure everyone that I own the game uh, properly as well. <laughs> Gasps, I know. Um, there we go. There we go. So now, can you guys hear the, the, me and the music of the game? Anyway, as I was saying about Crystallis, let's see here. There we go. Music is very low. I'll put it up a little bit more. There we go. I'm trying to keep it low so you guys can hear me, but we don't want to make it so low that... There we go. So, okay. We get our little intro here. 100 years have passed. <laughs> I like that. 100 years is enough for the, the world to, to change and the creatures to mutate. Uh, that mag magical pollution is something, right? Uh, this right here, this, but that said, what's being set up here is that um, in the sort of aftermath of this apocalypse, uh, the <laughs> it's true, we have no idea what life was like 100 years ago. Um, once evil merged, would we still stand a chance? There we go. So one fun 
fun bit of trivia I'm going to tell everybody right now is that when I first wrote Break, uh, one of the origins, one of the histories was that you woke up in a little tube, a little containment cryo tube like this, and you were from the past. Uh, but unfortunately, the more, more we got into the game, the less that worked because it kind of ruined the flow of character creation and it kind of messed with the idea of um, like uh, your characters being from like a living world. So I scrapped that, but I do like the idea. Oh man, only one exclamation point. Well, that's how you know he's just, it's not the full thing. But anyway, so your little guy wakes up. See, there I am. As you can see, you see, and this is why when I first played uh, Breath of the Wild, I was so excited because Link woke up in a little blue pool, just like our hero of Crystallis gets out of his like weird cryo chamber. Um, but yeah, so we originally, I originally, my original notes for the game, one of the origins was that you were from the past like this. Um, but... Uh, it kind of ended up being scrapped for a, ver a variety of reasons. Um, that said, let's go ahead. We move out here. <laughs> hey, there's a guy coming out of the cave. I too would run, honestly. I can't blame this random peasant guy. Uh, but, you know, we get here. One thing that I've always... Uh, uh, no, we'll get to a future... We'll get to a... Uh, no future supplement origin. We'll get there someday. I'll probably make separate rules for, for playing characters from different Aeons. Um, but yeah. As you can see, the sprites are nice and big, so you can kind of get a good look at our, our little guy and his purple hair and a tank top and stuff. Um, you can see here, we got this big town. This is the Village of Leaf. And you get the lowdown. <laughs> I'm sorry I ran from you when we first met. Um, the main character of this game, I actually would say, would not be... Uh, he. I could justify Dimensional Stray, though, uh, to spoil a bit of the game, he's not from a different world. Uh, he's from... Um, uh, he was very intentionally put there in the past, but... Uh, um, but I actually say the power in here, so most of the stuff you get here uh, is like from items. So technically, he'd actually probably be a champion or a raider. But I think if you wanted to emulate the sort of move set he gets the best, a battle princess would not be a bad way to go. Uh, anyway, Zebu says he's having a hard time with the windmill guard. He's always sleeping. Anyway, so it's really funny because just like a lot of these old games, they sort of plunge you in the middle of something without telling you too much of what you need to do. But then you got to this guy, and he's like, did you visit the Elder's house yet? And I'm like, okay. Um, but yeah, I'd say the main character of this game, you could get away with the Dimensional Stray, because even if he's not technically a... Um, the wind here is always cold, but we're used to it. Also, I love here that it's straight up, there's a lot of Nausicaa influences in Crystallis. I actually played Crystallis before I had seen Nausicaa. So even though I would say Nausicaa ended up being a huge influence on me, I'd say a lot of a lot of uh, me seeking out Nausicaa was because of this game. Uh, even though this game kind of like um, really misses a fundamental point of the Nausicaa movie. Um, but yeah, you have finally awoken. So he gives me some money from the Wiseman Zebu. Uh, and then as immediately after giving the money to me, he's He's straight up just very rude, which I always thought was very funny. Um, but yeah, oh no, I don't care. Uh, something to note about this game, rather than most RPGs um, of this time, like most games like this time, you just have to walk into somebody to talk to them. So there is occasional like where you'll get like repeated dialogue because you're just happen to bump into a person. Um, anyway, I can't remember. He gives me a hundred. So I think I go here, and I'd like to buy things. And you see, 
right? The dream, the dream is I would like to wake up and get money from a random stranger. Just for them to go, ah, oh, yes, you are the prophesized person. Here's some cash. Like, if, if I woke up and somebody handed me, like, a hundred bucks, I'd be okay with that. Um, yeah, I, too, was really amazed the first time I saw Nausicaa. I think, um, as somebody mentioned in that chat, uh, it was, like, a revelation for me because I obviously, uh, at, that at the time I had seen Nausicaa, I had already... I've been watching anime for a, a, several years, and I I started watching anime when it was mostly just OVAs, um, like original video animation and stuff. Like I'd rent them at the comic book store, our comic book store that was nearby my house, and um, so I was used to two kinds of anime at the time, uh, which were like either these these sort of uh, really hastily translated or fan subbed TV shows with kind of limited animation but were really big and fun when it came to story or like these kind of ones with like really gorgeous animation and production values but like the story was usually either an afterthought or pretty simple um, so when I first watched Nausicaa and it was just this gorgeous movie uh, and like this really sweeping story and all this stuff I was just like blown away by how cool it was in my head and like also it was like a fantasy thing uh, and it, it was so much like so many of the, the video games I liked at the time as far as the setting was goes and that's because so many of the video games I liked uh, were also influenced by Nausicaa so it made sense um, but yeah okay anyway back to buying things here as you can see i have 100 gold pieces and i can only either afford tanned hide or the shield i can't get both uh typical typical of rpgs at the time so i'm gonna buy myself some tanned hide and no i don't have any money so um well yeah technically the active block is nice but i i like my i'm, I'm kind of a, a big on an armor kind of guy so me uh hastings but yeah that was that was um yeah that it was a local comic book store nearby called bookstop and then later play things that was where i got anime and, and gaming stuff for the longest time yeah so two hand builds are valid too so funny enough you don't really have a lot of of options with our poor little hero here he just does the sword and shield but i i i like the sword and shield it's dependable Anyway, something I think is really fun, now I don't want to drop it, is that when you put on armor, you actually look like you're wearing little armor in the sprite. And even though that's pretty relatively standard, uh, relatively <laughs> standard nowadays in video games, it was I always thought it was like as a kid, I was like, oh, wow, he looks different when he puts on stuff. Um, if you don't use a shield, you can RP a two-handed build. I guess that's true. Well, we'll be RPing a two-handed build for a while. Um, the inn we go to if we want to restore health and save. I don't need to do that right now. We go in here. I am the village elder. You awoke from inside the cave, didn't you? You, you were told you, were, you would arrive. You are our last hope to defeat evil. Receive this sword to protect you on your quest. This and others like it will guide you. So, the Sword of the Wind, like I said, the Nausicaa parallels are already very strong. Um, well, it is dangerous to go alone, yes. Da, da, da. Uh, my armor vanished because I was supposed to go here first, but anyway. Um, there's an old windmill to the north, but I've never seen it working. Remember, they noted that the guard is at the windmills always sleeping. See here. Now, something very fun... Uh, is that later on you get an item that lets you talk to animals, so they actually have dialogue bosses and bo boxes instead of just the weird sounds. Uh, that kind of made it into break as a quirk, uh, because I think it's fun to be able to talk to animals. Um, oh, I already went in here. That was Zebu's disciple. So let's go ahead. I now am using the Sword of Wind. As you can see, I got my little sword attack here. Very long. I like, I like here one of the few 8-bit sword guys who actually goes the full length with his sword when he uses it. Uh, I've, I don't think I've ever fully recovered with how dinky Link's sword is in The Adventure of Link, the second Zelda game. So this was a pleasant surprise. Um, 
If you'll note here, I actually have two moves. Uh, well, kind of. Like right now, I have my basic stab. This is pretty good. It's rapid. I can I could go and do this all day. But if I hold down, I actually charge up and get a little magic here. So this is why uh, when someone suggested he could be, you know, this he does have some magic capabilities. So that's one of the reasons I was like, okay, Battle Princess might be might not be a bad choice for him. Um, uh, you're aware of, uh, speaking of Zelda 2, you're aware of Robin Poe's Sheep Lad game, right? No, but I will check it out after, I will check it out after the stream. Um, but anyway, uh, I should, one thing here, and this is kind of an odd thing that made it into break that I want to talk about. Uh, I really like these sort of top-down, uh, adventure sort of action-y games that were very popular in the wake of Zelda. You know, your, uh, your East your East games, your uh, Farias, your Crystallises, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the reasons was is because you have this relatively simple... You generally in these games have relatively simple methods of attacking, but you have to use it in different ways. You kind of have to apply that same tool, that same one attack in a lot of different ways to defeat various bosses and that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, that's true. He does get Psychic Powers, Breberg. You're right. Um, but anyway, um, and so that kind of ingrained itself in my head as a legitimate way for abilities in RPGs in general. Like one thing I tried to do with Break is, uh, in, like there's a there's a variety of tactical actions and stuff you can take in combat, but like not like, but they're they're fairly like straightforward and they kind of can be applied broadly. And I think that's a good way to do a lot of RPGs. Like, I'm not saying very specific stuff is bad. It just wasn't the route I went. Uh, so that kind of one way that got me here. So, okay. First, we're going to appreciate this music. Because this song has been stuck in my head for a good uh, decade or two now. Probably more than a decade. The 90s was a long time ago. So, okay. Um, there's our slime, and we'll see here, you can kind of hit them. Uh, something you generally want to do in a lot of these old games, even though they don't tell you to do it, is level up a bit. So I'm going to kill slimes here. Uh, I'm going to try to find an enemy that's a little gives me a little more experience than the one that a slime does. There's some tiger guys out here, if I recall. There they are. See, they give me a whole... I think they only give me like one experience here. Okay. Okay. Wow. They also drop money though. <laughs> if we, if I had gone, I did, did get draw a lot from East uh, when it comes from break to break, but only setting wise, much less. That said, actually, um, that said, as much as I like East's setting, I actually did not get as much from it as I as it might seem because East has a very like in spite of being a high fantasy setting all its places kind of have a real world equivalent and even though I obviously took influences from some real world places in break I tried to avoid being too stringent um, I like the freedom of making an entirely fantasy world and uh, just because I think if you um I think if you stick to doing something real world, that's good because people connect with it. But I think there's a responsibility to also then be responsible with how you portray people. If you know, if you go, you know, uh, real world people and stuff like that. So I was like, all right, if I kind of be I'm a little more abstract with what the people in the outer world are like, if I'm a little more like based in fiction. Um, it kind of it doesn't abdicate me entirely of responsibility. Obviously, I still have to be sensitive and I have to be nuanced about how to do stuff. Um, but it did mean I had a little more freedom. I could have a little more wacky stuff. So that was another reason I liked this game so much is that it's such a weird alien landscape, and I always I thought that was really fun. Um, the first time I played, I did not grind. It was not even able to hurt the vampire boss. Yeah, that one's that one's rough. Uh, that happened to me in East uh, 3, actually. I got the, for my Super Nintendo, my first East game was Wanderers from YS, or Wanderers from East, I'm sorry. I've been saying it right this whole time, and then I just threw it there. 
you know, you can also be daring and charge them like this. I tend to use the shot because I'm a I'm a a cautious lad when it comes to these games. But sometimes if you're cornered, you have to do the rapid thing here. Ten more of those guys here. This is the exciting this is the excitement of old games, everyone, is that there's always a little grinding to do. Uh, but, you know, I'm actually pro level and money grinding. It's always been kind of a zen thing for me. Um, I almost actually included... Um, I almost included a sort of nod to level grinding in Break as a downtime activity until I realized that... Um, that would kind of supersede all the other fun stuff you could do in downtime. If you could just go, oh, do this instead, and you get a bunch of experience points, that would actually, like, as as funny as that was to me, in-game that ends up just being kind of um, the, the best way to get powerful really quickly, and therefore, you know, you'll take it over doing cool stuff like seeking out adventure, or, like, finding, uh, you know, trying to be buddy buddy friends with your you know and get social bonds and that kind of stuff so i i scrapped it uh yeah yeah i think that's something i think about a lot uh i, I do think it was a good call food dinner um that's true i think there's there's a there is a um downtime ability called go on like an individual where you go on like a sort of individual adventure that i made for people who like to do things to have their characters do things that the rest of the party really couldn't like say you have a sneak character and he and the sneak wants to go like rob some guy's house and the rest of the party are like as the rest of the party is like a battle princess a sage and you know, a like a champion they're not going to be particularly good or inclined at like burglary so I made a downtime activity for people to do that kind of stuff. And I think that kind of is like the stand-in for like the level grinding thing. Okay, we're almost level two, everybody. Exciting times. But yeah, as I was saying, I'm, I'm sort of pro-level grinding in games just because, yeah, excellent, your level is increased. That just gives me a little more life. Um, it's, a very, it's a zen activity for me. It makes me feel calm and good. Um, so anyway, we're going to go in this cave. What's going on? See that cave music? And then, if I recall, this cave is blocked off, and I'm going to be like, oh no, never mind. I'm Zebu Break. <laughs> I like that I, I put that exclamation point for accuracy, but now it's, it's going to be this floating punctuation in the game. Zebu, if you recall, is the guy the Zebu's disciple is talking about. Um... Try to make the windmill work. If you can do this, I will teach you some magic. So, okay. Um, I did like grinding in Final Fantasy XII, where you could use the Gambit system to basically automate easy battles. Yeah, I think that, like, the the sort of... Um, the sort of best games that are sort of self-aware of grinding, um, they'll do stuff like, um, you know, uh, uh, give you a way to automate battles or, like, Kind of make it a little faster. Uh, these games generally did not because much of the game <laughs> was grinding. Uh, but yeah, the, it, it can be fun as long as the the thing is you have to. The thing about good level games that do level grinding well, uh, I think, is um, you kind of have to make sure that um, I'm trying to remember. So. If you recall, if you recall everybody, one of the townspeople said that they've been having trouble with the new windmill guard because he keeps falling asleep. So the first thing I have to do is find a way to fix that. And the best way to do that, like all good adventures, is just to explore every random place I have access to. So I'm going in this cave. See, here we got here. Here's, a, here's our sleeping guard. And I have to it's been a little bit since i played see here's our windmill and i'm looking here and there's no way to start it the windmill guards asleep and it's just not going so i now know where it is um if i so i what i have to do is find a thing to wake up the guard and i have to explore every place to find it so i'm going to go back out here um but one thing i like about this too is already already in this sort of setting 
Um, there's like obviously like kind of remnants of old technology. Uh, there's this windmill, which isn't that modern, but if you recall, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I was getting to it. <laughs> I was getting there, but I need money to buy the alarm flute, so that's why I'm killing. I'm killing these tigers. Um, look at him, look at that saunter. Um, but I like that, you know, um, you know, in the the very start, you you wake up from that sort of obviously like sort of computerized device. Uh, you've got, um, you know, obviously it's post apocalypse, and more, throughout the game, you find you see more and more high-tech stuff. And in fact, one of the villains, um, you know, I can spoil the game a little bit because we're obviously not going to beat it uh, anytime soon. Uh, I'm probably just gonna play like the first part here. Um, but uh, the villain of the game is somebody who's, is this sort of emperor general guy who's discovered some of this ancient technology and wants to use it to, um, you know, take over the world because he's an evil military guy and that's what they do. And uh, that's obviously from Nausicaa, straight up for like the God Warrior and all that stuff. Um, but uh, it's also very reminiscent of both uh, Castle in the Sky and also um, Future Boy Conan, which are both also Hayao Miyazaki works that I highly recommend if you want to look at Good Break's uh, inspiration. More so Castle in the Sky, but uh, Future Boy Conan does have some pretty good, uh, is also just a really good show in its own right. Um, but something that Gray and I have already started doing, and Gray's really good about this too, because he'll make suggestions whenever I come up with like detailed a detailed place um uh we always try to include some weird quirky thing like you know uh i was mentioning the other day like you know giant fa flora um ah what was that? Don't do that again. All right, guy. It's you. Please don't tell Zebu. I'll take take the start the windmill. There's a strange ball hidden inside these caves. And so now I have the windmill key. Uh, you should watch just watch all the Ghibli and Miyazaki movies on principle. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm trying to you know not all of them are going to be good inspiration for Break, but they're all pretty good. Um, the windmill begins to work. Thanks, message here. And we get a little fun little animation where the windmill gets to work. Uh, but yeah, something that we try to do with every place in break is to give every town like a kind of weird little quirk that either connects it to the past or like, you know, gives us some magical quality or something like that. Um, and a big part of that is every town in this game, every town in this game. And in fairness, most towns in most JRPGs and most uh, video games have some kind of weird thing about them. It's um, a big thing for me here. Um, this is a good time to tell everybody that the slimes in Break are all uh, actually basically animated magical pollution. Oh gosh dang it. Figuring out how old tech can be used incorrectly, but still usefully by people who find it in post-apocalypse is just really fun. Yes, yet another vagabond. I agree. Um, you know, I wish I would. Uh, I wish I would. I got. I keep switching over the chat and running into these guys. Uh, I should probably uh, sleep at the inn first. Dun, 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 dun. My plan to get you killed is working. Yeah, thanks. You, you see, if you do that, so if I die on screen today, uh, Gray is going to have bragging rights because he told me I better practice beforehand, and I told him my Crystal skills were unparalleled. Um, 
That said, I got pretty used to playing it on my Switch. Um, today, as I am again, uh, I cannot, unfortunately cannot use original hardware, but I was able to whip out my uh, 8-bit do controller that looks like a little NES controller, uh, which so I, I feel right at home playing this. Also, I should say, I have some whiskey here I'm drinking. I have a um, YouTuber I really like named Jeremy Parrish, and he used to do these streams called Gin Tendo, and he would always have some gin or something that he was drinking while he was playing an old Nintendo game. Um, and so I thought I should do have a drink while I play today, too. You know, it is funny because actually I just realized if you wanted to play a character in Break who could basically fire magic blasts off like that um, early on at least, uh, that actually would be a murder princess. Uh, and the more I think about it, our hero, our Crystallis hero, uh, he does not have a soul companion. I now have Refresh. So Refresh is a great spell because it heals you. Um, but anyway. I'm gonna go ahead. I don't usually keep it on except when I'm I'm in danger because sometimes your finger slips and you use magic when you don't need to. Um, but we'll go ahead here. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Um, the uh, So I think actually our, our he doesn't have a soul companion like the Battle Princess would. So I think, actually, our hero here has been a murder princess this entire time. Um, and he is fighting what he hates, which is imperialism. Uh, kind of. I guess the dolphin could, in fact, be a soul companion, but the dolphin also just might be a friend, because uh, it's got its own, its own uh, you know... Um, you know, it doesn't follow him around forever. It just kind of like you kind of responds to it. You, you have a sort of of uh, equivalent, uh, you know, uh, exchange of services for the dolphin. Uh, but yeah, I do think Murder Princess. If you wanted to do, um, he he gets a weird myriad a bit of of uh, powers though, so it's it's kind of hard to say. But yeah, so in here. These little guys give a lot more experience, or I'm sorry, not a lot more. They give two experience points instead of one, so... I'm hoping by the time I leave the cave, I'll be able to get a shield as well. We'll be really rolling in the dough here. Um, but yeah, so I might have to stat out the main character from Crystallis as a, um, as a uh, character in Break after there's... Yeah, my X level's increased. Just because it would be fun, but he would actually be pretty simple, I think. Um, that said, too, he might actually be the chosen one um, adversary uh, entry instead of a player character, too. Uh, because, to spoil the plot a bit, he is essentially a um, bureaucratically not a bureaucratically appointed chosen one. Uh, here we go. I now have med med medical herb. That's really good because if I get hurt... Oh, I hate... Anyway, one of the rules of video games is if bats show up, they're annoying. So... Oh! Well, you can go. He, he did. So, um, to spoil a bit of the game, uh, you find out later uh, that he's one of two people that were kind of um, chosen. They were basically uh, chosen by this committee to wake up and uh, initiate this sort of uh, reset uh, <laughs> program if humanity ever got powerful enough to destroy itself again. Um, and in this case, you don't go through with the reset. You just you just kind of kill the dude. You you kill the guy who's who's trying to be a uh, megalomaniacal warlord, and then you go up the floating tower that was mentioned in the intro, 
and stop the program uh, kind of thing. Uh, so it's le the ball of wind. I always laughed at this as a kid because the ball of wind, I feel like, would not be a very substantial thing, right? You just kind of have a, a ball. But So in this game, you have... Uh, you have these sort of orbs and bracers that you get. The bracers are like the powered up version. And what they do is they correspond with a particular sword. So if you notice here, I currently have the sword of wind and the ball of wind. I don't know why they didn't translate that as an orb of wind. Uh, and that gives me a better uh, attack. I get a bigger, I can shoot a bigger blast now. Later on, you get the bracelet, bracelet of, of wind that lets you shoot a tornado for a little extra MP. Um, but what's really important about these, this sort of increased attack here is that um, it can smash stone walls. And if you recall, the cave Zebu was in had a stone wall behind it. So let's go ahead here. If you haven't noticed, I've stopped caring about the bats because they just don't do that much damage, but I'm still kind of aggravated by them. Can you mix and match sword and orbs? No. Oh no, I'm poisoned. That's bad. Um, no, you can't, unfortunately. Uh, it is important to keep track of the swords and orbs you're using, though, because certain enemies can only hurt be hurt by certain elements. So, for example, these green guys here can only be hurt by the wind. Later on, I'll, I'll fight guys that can only be hurt by fire. Um, and earth and all that sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> so then making you equip each one is just an annoyance for no reason. Well, I think I think there is some reason uh, to do so. No, don't, I don't want to drop it. Um, it's not the greatest reason. It adds a little. It does add a little challenge to it because you got to switch in between battles and stuff like that. Um, it is kind of unintuitive. I think, I think in a if this game had come out for like say the Super Nintendo uh, rather than the NES, you we probably would have seen switching your sword, uh, the sword you're using, map to like another button. But since the NES only really had the two button, the two face buttons, it kind of ends up being. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. I think if we had gotten a shoulder button version of this game, there would have been a lot. It would have been a lot easier. But yeah, yes, you do have to manually switch the orbs and the swords. <laughs> um, oh no, my magic power is too low. All right, so here we go. I've forgotten about poison, and I didn't buy any antidote. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna rush to town and hope I don't die. <laughs> no. I can't die on screen! Gray will make so much fun of me! Oh no! Oh, I forgot about poison! Oh, and I don't think I saved. Okay, fortunately for me. So here's what we say. I can't keep it a secret from everybody because it just happened on screen. But, all right, well, anyway, so that should be a lesson to you kids. Poison in old video games is no joke. So in Break, Poison, classic Poison, is, <laughs> your silence can be bought. I can't, I, I just dropped a big amount of money for um, uh, br my car break, so I can't pay you off, unfortunately. Yes, and the orbs do become passive once you get the bracelet. Uh, you don't have to go bracelet, then orb. Um, I'm not... I can't send that PDF early right now. Anyway, so first things first, we're going to go to the inn. Oh, no, no, I didn't want to hit no. Anyway, as I was saying, um, break has several status ailments, many of them. I know I've mentioned them before on these streams. Um... But they are, one of them is represented, one of them is putrefaction, which is basically your heart slowly draining uh, every turn, which is how I incorporated the sort of classic video game poison into the game. Um, however, putrefaction uh, usually comes with a fun effect when you hit zero, like depending on 
on what caused the putrefying effect. Just clipping the desk to make sure Gray sees it. Thanks, food dinner. He'll, <laughs> he's gonna, gosh. Dang it, after I talk such a big game. Um, see here, don't forget to buy your antidotes. But I say that I'm not going to buy an antidote because I need to buy something way more important than an antidote, which is a shield. So now, now I'm a full grown adventure here. Check out my little shield. This increases my defense. It's very nice. Um, shields and break are pretty good too. And that's just because uh, weapons got a nice boost, obviously. Like you can, you can sort of cater uh, by the weapon that caters to your taste. If you like to do damage, you can buy a mighty weapon. If you like to make sure you hit, you can buy a master weapon. If you like to be dodgy, you can buy a quick weapon. Uh, but shields and break, I don't think. I didn't skimp on them either. Uh, not only do most of them give a passive defense bonus, um, once a combat, you can use a shield to, to deflect an attack that would have hit. Um, and uh, I think this is a pretty good ability, obviously. It's a, it's a really good Hail Mary. Uh, and But I did have to add a little silliness to it where... Um, well, not silliness, but there's a little wrinkle there. If you use it to, if you use a normal shield to block, like say, like a magical attack or like a spell, the shield will break because I think that's fun. Um, oh yeah, there is a couple of mods you can throw onto shields as well. If you get a magical shield, if you get a shield made of magical material or some kind of special shield like that, you could use it to block spells, which I think is cool. Uh, certain spells, obviously, if the spell doesn't have like a physical. If the spell doesn't do, it doesn't. If spells of fire like a beam at you or something like that, you can block. But like if the spell like enchants you, it's not going to work. Um, boomerang shield mod. Oh, that would be cool. I, I think I, I'll, I'll probably have to throw that in there. At least a shield you can use as a boomerang, because those are always fun. Uh, anyway, though, I'm going to go ahead and earn enough money to buy a medical herb as well, since I used one to try and not die. Uh, and died anyway, like a fool. And you know what? Everyone's going to say, didn't, didn't you want to buy an antidote? And I'm like, no. I won't get poisoned again. That's foolish. So, um, something that I also did in break, uh, and somebody noted about the potions being, um, the potions being like, in the book are illustrated as uh, cola, like as uh, soft drinks. Um, and I point out that uh, you know, uh, almost any kind of uh, beverage can be a potion in, in break based on how it's made. So like coffee and tea, po some potions might be coffee or tea style potions and that kind of stuff. And one of the reasons I did that is because I wanted to make it a little more, make a little more sense as to why you'd be able to buy them in a normal town. Um, you know, uh, it's something regular people, if they have, uh, regular people can make like a, a potion if they've got like the materials to do so. And I wanted to make that common because one, I think potions are fun. I think magical consumables, like consumables adventures can buy are fun. Um, and two, it just kind of adds some color to the world. So you can have, like, uh, you know, the local, um, you know, there's a potion vendor in town and in a town. And the reason why they can stay in business, even if adventures aren't around, is because people just want to buy, like. Okay, what are we doing here, guys? Do I have to be back further? Am I hitting the wrong thing? Hmm. Okay. So so you all don't think I'm crazy. I'm supposed to be able to blow open this this thing with the 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 sword, and I don't know why it's not happening. <laughs> I wonder if maybe I'm stepping too closely now. What's going on here?
We're gonna walk out. We're gonna walk out and try again. That's very weird. Oh, you're right! Gosh dang it, you are right. It requires the fire sword. I'm sitting here shooting at this. Ah. <laughs> like a fool. For some reason, I thought we moved right from here. I have to remember where to go from here. There's another spot, if I recall. I'm gonna get some stuff here. Yeah, uh, Breberg is correct. I am trying to skip a portion of the game. I have to get the fire sword and the fire orb to do that. Because it turns out that's not stone, that's that's ice. Let's see here. So, uh, but yeah, anyway, I like the idea of mostly normal people able to make items that are useful, not just for themselves, but for adventures and that kind of stuff. I just feel like that's a little more fun. Um, I'm trying to remember. It might be in this cave, actually. Oh. It has been... No, that's not it. But yeah, um, I think to, uh, oh, hey, hey, Zach, how are you doing? Uh, I am having, a, I am having a good one. And yes, thank you for congratulations on the Kickstarter. Um, it's, uh, it's been a wild ride, like looking at that Kickstarter. I, I check it, I try to check it, and I try to get, answer the comments and stuff, but I'm also trying not to be someone who's constantly refreshing and watching it, because I know that'll just stress me out. Um, but it's, it's been pretty good, it's been going pretty well. Uh, you guys will have to endure me fumbling around a bit while I remember exactly where the next area is. Um, But, no, that's not here. I already went this way. Yeah, that requires them. And Zebu doesn't give me anything. He just, just used my power to open the way. All right, cool. Thanks, Zebu. That's one thing in, in um, break I won't do to you all, by the way. I won't make you manually, I won't make you manually select orbs. I will give you cryptic weirdo NPCs. But you can probably negotiate. There's one thing you can you can use Break's robust negotiation system to get them to tell you more. Very cool. Call. There's an exit, another exit around here, and I'm trying to remember where it is. Yeah, it's good to ponder the you know it's good to ponder the old orbs, right? We all love to ponder orbs. I wonder if the person who drew that picture of the wizard looking at the um, at the orb would realize it would become some enduring enduring inside joke amongst the nerds. Like, I feel like modern artists know uh, if they draw something, there's always a chance it'll become an enduring joke among nerds, a meme, if you will. Um, but I don't think anybody, like, <laughs> Def going to make a sage who's just about acquiring more orbs to ponder. Uh, one of my favorite bits of dark of darker recently was that you could equip orb and dagger as a wizard loadout. That's pretty good, honestly. Orb and dagger. Also, I will say, um, your sage, your sage in break uh, can in fact um, ponder orbs because uh, everyday divination. Um, is a pretty um, 
uh, is, a, is one of the abilities it can take, and they need a reflective surface, which could be an orb. Um, I'm trying to remember, too. It might be... I can't... Wasn't that spot? That was it. I wasn't there. It's the area by the windmill, but outside the rocks. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I was trying to figure out. Because I know there was another cave. Oh, you know what? It's in the same cave I got the orb in. Yeah, I forgot. I was for some reason I thought there was a third cave. I don't as much as I've played this game, I think I always fumble around in the beginning like this because I just go and like there's a lot of fun goofy ways to solve puzzles in this game. Uh I think one of my favorite is that uh in classic kind of anime fashion um uh there's a a a city you find that's um, uh, only women are allowed to, to go into to, to hang around in, kind of like in Breath of the Wild with the Garuda town. And your solution is that you get this disguise ring part, part, at some point in the game, and that ring... Um, there's the one I can destroy with my... Yeah, that's the one I was supposed to blow up. Um, there's this ring you can get that lets you choose a bunch of disguises, and one of them is a lady, and so you have to go around the town as her. Um, there won't be any gender-locked town in Break, uh, to, but I do like, I do like the ability. Like, I would maybe make something where it's like, oh, you know, if you're not wearing a silly hat, you can't wear in this town. Um, Kind of thing, but I always like, I like the using weird, I like having weird magic items that aren't necessarily like, um, there we are. Yeah, I need another one of those. But I like having items that are kind of, uh, you know, are, are at least solutions that involve weird items and that kind of stuff. Um. Oh no! What I tell you about the bats, everyone? Ah. Oh! All right, not again. Ah! Oh no, that's two deaths. Oh, it's so bad. Oh. Oh. Oh, Gray's gonna make so much fun of me. <laughs> oh no. Alright. He was right, I did embarrass myself. No, the vampire is not weak to hugs. I was wrong. It's the streaming. I guess you're right. I'm gonna blame it. I'm gonna take this this kind-hearted, kind-hearted uh, comment and keep it true. It's because I'm streaming and paying attention to the chat as well. Otherwise, I'd just be a master. Um. <laughs> no, please gas me up. I, I need it. I need this. But yeah, so. Uh, that is one of my favorite old boss strategies in video games. Um, is the whole, like, I shoot and disappear, um, kind of things. Um, and so you're, you're kind of strategizing between, between trying to shoot them, get them soon enough, and also dodge their shots and all that stuff. I love that kind of thing. I think it's a really good, um tense way that old games used to do used to kind of um do these boss fights 
And I have yet to figure out a fun way to make that work in Brick as a tabletop thing. Um, because obviously, since given the nature of it, uh, the closest I've been able to do is, for example, um, the there's a uh, a villainous wizard kind of uh, archetype in Break in the Break book that um, utilizes a uh, um, Fun is the, definitely the operative word in that, yeah. Right, I could just make that a thing that happens in Break, but it doesn't mean it's going to be fun to interact with like it is in here. Um, uh, there's a villainous wizard archetype in, in Break. Uh, you've probably seen him because Gray posted the art of him. Uh, he's the one setting fire to the uh, to that that's the sort of burning city in that illustration. Ah, um, oh, gosh dang it. No, I don't want to draw. If I keep one bat out, oh no, never mind. He summons a second bat anyway. <laughs> Gosh dang it. I'm going to try and stop talking while I actually do this. There we go. we got to wait for the bats to explode. The AC was a load-bearing boss. These bats are the real boss here. Um, anyway, this villainous archetype in Break, or this wizard, uh, he has a barrier that he can... Or I should say they. The, the example is a man. But you could kind of use this creature, uh, this adversary entry to template your own evil, evil, powerful wizard type. But they can summon a barrier that you have to break down before you can hurt them, and they can restore that barrier with an action. Uh, and that was my closest thing I could come up with, with the whole disappearing, reappearing wizard kind of thing. Um, I've always wanted to run a game in a setting that runs on video game rules and everybody knows it. I think Break will be great for that. That's fair. Um, I tried not to be. I tried to like make the gaminess of the setting kind of implicit, as opposed to like it's not like say um, a lot of of uh, fantasy anime where they can literally call up their character sheets and stuff like that. But I think if you wanted to do that in the game, that would be really easy to say is happening. It's okay. I have the rabbit boots. Uh, is the barrier an additional HP bar basically, or a mechanism that can be manipulated by the environment? Uh, as it stands, it's kind of just additional HP. It's a couple of hearts you have to break through. Um, it's supposed to be sort of a um, film that's over them. Like it's a very, it's a literal personal barrier. I did consider a sort of Magneto style barrier where he's got like the, they've got like the orb around them that they're flying around in. But um, this particular adversary already has a lot of mechanics in play. And I thought adding another one would be really rough on GMs trying to, to, to run this bad guy. That's something I keep, try to keep in mind whenever I'm designing uh, monsters and stuff for Break. Is, yes, you want, it to be, you want them to be very cool. You want them to have lots of cool abilities. But if you give them too many cool abilities, they're like not going to be... Um, they're not going to be really usable, right? Because you're going to miss one of those abilities at some point. It shouldn't shouldn't be homework to run a monster. But anyway, I want to show off um, the rabbit boots which you just put on. Allow you to jump. Yeah. Overtooling. I've not heard that term, but that's basically it. Yeah. Uh, it's super easy to do, I think, too, because you want, you want to make sure... Uh, I think it would be really easy for me to do in, in break, especially because um, ah, that's why. Yeah. Got to take off my mat. So you can jump now. Very good stuff. Um, you don't need special boots to jump and break, but supernatural leaping is an ability you can get. I don't think this is quite far enough to be supernatural leaping, but he does get, he does get some good air time here. Check that out. Oh, okay. Look at that guy. Ah! He threw an X. I forgot about these guys. But yeah, I think it's I think it's always something I try to keep in mind. 
Uh, I want all the adversaries in Break to have a cool gimmick that makes them fun to deal with um, and makes them fun to run. Like, to me, fun monsters are, in a lot of ways, the a big part of what makes being a GM fun. But uh, they are porks, yes. Uh, so sad we didn't get them in the main book regularly, but they'll be, they'll be, don't worry, they'll be in there. Okay, hear that, that dinging, no that sort of tinging noise? That means my weapon is not actually hurting that mushroom. So it's a danger, we have to be careful around it. Um, but yeah, we'll get porks in there. I love those guys. Um, oh, that's not where I want to go yet. That's another dangerous area. Um... Universal no damage tank. That's true. That was such a common. Uh, I, it's something that I think we took for granted, but good sound design has always been important for video games. Like something to let you know they've gotten hit, something to let you know that they're taking damage. Um, I think one of the most frustrating things about revisiting a lot of um, sort of obscure games I didn't play when I was a kid, especially ones that don't, didn't make it out into the United States. Um, is I'll play some of them and they will have like very bad indicators as to whether you hit or that kind of stuff. All right, give me a second here. What makes a monster fun to run as a GM for you? I always find myself basing those sort of metrics on how the players interact with a given thing. That's a good question. And um, what I think makes a fun monster is something that lets me uh, that gives me a little bit of leeway in how it works and sort of uh, as a GM something that like uh, I, I'm like oh it would be fun to use this ability on this person or uh, stuff that makes the players deal with a new situation is also something I think is really fun anything that sort of um, encourages people to kind of uh, really interact with the fiction of said monster and, and the encounter is always good to me so, like, uh, a favorite I always bring up um, is the Champa, which is a sort of big mouth, like, stompy creature in the break book. And the Champa, its main thing is that, well, it chomps. It's got its big mouth. And it can basically swallow, like, basically bite and, and swallow characters. But I think swallow whole is actually kind of boring as a ability on its own because it just means one player kind of is stuck in the mouth. It can be exciting because the other players then rush to save them, uh, which I don't think is, that's not that's not nothing, but it, it also kind of stinks for the character. So while Champas can do that, if you're feeling it, they can chew on them, bring their hearts down, that kind of stuff. They also have the ability uh, to spit the whatever's in their mouth back out as an attack. Um, and this is because I think the funniest thing to do in the world is to uh, shoot one player character into another player character as an attack. Um, and I love those monsters because, um, right, sometimes you could like fight or trick your way out. Um, yeah, uh, the, 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 the spit out attack thing is, it's one of my favorites because one, even if the, you know the the player even if they miss with the I, there's a joke there you can kind of either try to catch the character that spit out at you or dodge them and if you dodge them you avoid damage but the other character ends up like sprawled out on the ground so they're still toppled which is you know they have to either spend a turn getting themselves out um just totally reskinning as a kirby <laughs> um and i really like that ability for that reason because it makes the player stop and think and it makes all the players involved. And yes, uh, someone mentioned in the chat, um, they have a friend who doesn't like removed from play abilities. And that's also something I try to keep in mind because I think those are not those are kind of not fun too, right? Like I think status ailments are fun. Like weird things that happen to your character are fun because they make you deal with a thing that's happened to your character. But it's not as fun if that thing that happened to your character is, oh, you died right away or uh, oh, you basically can't do anything. So even like the petrification in in break, the, like your character turning to stone or getting frozen over, um, it takes three turns to take full effect. So your character is slowly losing their mobility um, rather than 
just losing it right away. And I thought that was kind of fun because then you're taking each turn to go, oh, okay, I got I to gotta figure out what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to figure out what I got to do. And so that was something that... Um, and all the other status ailments are either things you... are either weird situations for your character to deal with or like the petrification, something that takes time. So you have either time to stop what's happening to you or you can strategically try to decide what you're going to do with the time before the uh, effect either takes you out or, or changes your situation irreparably. So, um, and, and that's the kind of thing that makes monsters fun for me. Uh, stuff that encourages, stuff that encourages you to interact with it and interact with the game. Um, that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah. I also like monsters that feel big and dangerous. Um, which you can do without, without sort of, uh, you can do that without resorting to stuff like, oh, this monster kills you when he when he looks at you, kind of thing. That's I don't think that's very fun, but I think making like a giant monster that can pick you up and smack you on the ground, or making uh, a, a a sort of uh, um, otherworldly entity that can inflict uh, strange curses on you by just being its proximity. Those are fun, that kind of stuff. I like those kind of monsters a lot. Um, also, monsters that have one really big shot they can do uh, are also really fun. I have this thing. Um, it can be fun if it's telegraphed 100 miles out and the encounter revolves around prepping for it. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think that's a good point. One of the things we have in, one of the things in Break we do is every adversary has some tells and these are things that you can use to warn the player that they're coming up so like for example um there's a a, a um if a monster has an ability uh yes this area has some very lifelike statues it's exactly the kind of thing um and it gives you a sort of sight sound um and uh uh, you know, smell that you can use to kind of warn people of this thing coming up. Um, because, yeah, it's no fun. Okay, I would like everybody to admire my, my platforming skills there. Uh, that's poisonous ground. I dodged it. I think that makes up for my deaths earlier um, in the thing. Don't, don't you? Don't all of you think that makes up for the deaths? I do. Um, but yeah, as long as the players have time to prepare for it, Either when it's happening or... Um, okay, so I've made up for one death, is what you're saying. <laughs> um, as long as you do something the players can deal with. That's another thing, too. It's uh, If a creature has something that just outright like steamrolls a bunch of characters and they, they didn't really have a chance to react to it or deal with what's going on, I think that's not as fun. But if you hit them with something funny... <laughs> right away and then they have to try to deal with that for the whole combat that's also fun i think that's a great idea um one thing i say a lot is that break you cannot climb this yet you don't have enough power to make it that's my favorite version of a tree blocks the or a uh, a tree blocks the way kind of style of game design where your like mentor mentally contacts you and be like hey don't go that way yet if i recall the early Pokemon games have that with Dr. Oak yelling at you through the Pokedex where he's like, don't try to use that there. <laughs> a disembodied voice has not said I'm a whip. Sorry, everybody. I can't save the day. I don't think I'm going to get too much farther today. I've been, I have think I've been going for like a little over an hour and I probably want to stop before it gets too late, but I want to go a little bit more. I'm having fun talking about break. Um, but yeah, the, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of weird, of weird monsters that do fun things. Oh, I meant to ask any abilities that give player characters barriers themselves. Glad you asked that. Uh, the Sage has a an ability called a momentary fortress in which they summon an incredibly powerful shield, um, to block a particular attack or effect. Uh, it's one of my favorite abilities. Um, it can theoretically block everything, anything. 
However, it requires the sage to defeat the ability with it, their insight in a contest. And if you fail this roll, um, the uh, momentary fortress uh, is shattered and you can't use it for 24 hours. So it's kind of one of those abilities that you can use. It's very potent, but it's also got that sort of limit to it. So it's one of, it's a, one of my favorites. It's also a very cool idea, like, you know, like the dragon's fire or something like coming up and you stop it with a cool crystal shield. Uh, and yes, the battle princesses have um, a sort of little barrier ability they have at the start. Oh, wait, oof. Uh, so anyway, everybody, that was a poison forest and I can't go in there without the gas mask, as you just saw. Um, but yes, uh, battle princesses also give you a barrier. It's a one heart barrier, but they can give it to multiple people. Um, so that's the one. There's a couple. I like barriers. I think they're neato. Um, and uh, if you're a, a somebody who likes big shields, um, you can buy a big shield as a from the uh, uh, and sort of smash it into the ground, so it adds a, ends up leading a little bulwark. So that's also kind of a barrier. But yes. Um, big fan of, of barrier abilities. Um, I like I like also like active defense kind of stuff too. As a as a person who occasionally likes to play support style uh, things. Um, Final Fantasy Hey Final Fantasy 14 has a half its healers as barrier healers so it fits. Yeah, I was looking into that. Um, uh, there's a calling I want to make eventually called the Prophet, which is kind of a um, uh, a sort of uh, a mirror of the heretic and I want to give that one the ability to protect people and so I was looking at some of the Final Fantasy XIV abilities to see how they work. That said, it's very funny to me. Um, the Final Fantasy scholar, if I recall correctly, is more of a healer whereas in the um, uh, in Break the, the Sage is very much a sort of general mage type character. Um, oh, that's that's a good point. Um, you know, I kind of wish. I think that's always kind of a shame. Uh, one of the chat, one of the chatters mentioned they have nerve damage in their hands, so they can only play a certain class in Final Fantasy XIV. Um, I do hope game designers, like video game designers in the future, try to keep stuff like that more in mind and have these sort of uh, options that allow more more people to play. Uh, for that reason, um, but before I before I, I get too much farther in the game, um, I do want to say I mentioned before. Probably I want to mention a little, a few more Crystallis Crystallis facts, I guess, that tied into Break. Uh, I already mentioned that there's the the sort of primary plot is a very Break as one of the things that really inspired Break. So your character is actually kind of a failsafe uh, set in by ancient peoples in an attempt to prevent another war that would uh, cause an apocalypse. Uh, and so you wake up whenever, theoretically, you wake up to initiate the Godslayer program to um, uh, sort of reset the world so it doesn't get blown up by some guy with a giant magic cannon. And the villain, at least for the first part of the game, or for the most of the game, I should say, is this guy named General Draconis, uh, who is the head of the this empire. Um, and they've found all this ancient technology. Um, does your mentor know this? Uh, they kind of do in the form of the prophecy, right? So it turns out the prophecy that they have is actually like been passed down for this reason. And it's like, I always like that because even though it's technically a mystical prop prophecy, it has roots in something very mundane. Um, I should say, I say mundane, but the guys who, the civilization puts you there is a, definitely a Magitek civilization. They both have ancient sages and wizards alongside scientists and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, it's, it's pretty neat. I always thought it was a really fun twist. Um, like to have especially in an older game like this uh this game also does have a particularly like obviously it, it's not like gruesome to look at there's still little pixel graphics and like 
and that kind of stuff. But you come across at one of the dungeons, essentially, uh, you not only find out that um, you you find out that the people that are being kept there for the mines are people that were kidnapped from a town you had visited before. And you also see like people that these soldiers of this em this empire have killed uh, along the way. Uh, and similarly, uh, a lot of the villains in the break the break modules I've designed are kind of these people who are um, they're trying to cement their power uh, in various ways, and they tend to act in like kind of like that that sort of imperialistic manner. And it's something that I kind of took to heart as a kid when I was playing this game. Uh, I think this and Final Fantasy IV really cemented in my head and final fantasy 6 kind of really cemented in my head what um like what bad guys kind of look like in my head and and uh so that's a huge influence and i wanted to bring that up um you know uh, uh and like someone mentioned we mentioned way back in the beginning that this is very nausicaa influenced but they kind of got the wrong idea from nausicaa where um one of the bosses is an is essentially an omu from the Nausicaa movie, and if you've seen Nausicaa or read Nausicaa or any of the stuff there, you know the idea of turning an omu into like a sort of boss you need to hit till it dies is really antithetical to the actual story of Nausicaa. But it is a cool, it is a fun boss fight, and I do like the design; it's pretty neat. Um, so, I think uh, I hope I hope misinterpreting. Ghibli movies isn't something that I inherited from Crystallis, but who knows? I probably missed the I probably missed the bar somewhere along those lines. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, this game near and dear to my heart. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, this is how you save your game. I'm not, I'm gonna do it even though I don't really need to. Um, you know that pork that we mentioned? He's got a little dapper little vest on. Uh, I should make sure the porks in Break have little vests like that. I'll make sure to remind Gray uh, that they have vests. Yes, I agree. Something like an Omu would be really cool as a battlefield that you're fighting actual enemies on. I think, actually, that would be a really cool set piece kind of fight. If, say, you wanted to... Oh, I found the town, everybody. I'm Akana. I used to have an unusual statue, but I dropped it near near the river it was great to find it was a great final and difficult to replace have you seen it so i have to find that statue later um yeah i was gonna say um it would be an awesome set piece battle where like um you know the enemy is maybe the enemy is also could be agitating the omu like they were in the nausicaa movie like stabbing it or something like that to try to get it to attack someplace and you're both trying to get rid of a villain and also kind of calm the creature down uh, yeah, this dude's just carrying a statue around. In Break, carrying a big statue around is actually pretty hard because anything larger than three slot, three inventory slots can't be just stashed away on your person. And so this guy was overburdened carrying the statue around, uh, which is a, is a status ailment in Break. Um, but yeah, I also... Uh, it mentions in the rules, in the rules that you can fight on top of vehicles and they're sort of bat mobile battlefield areas. I feel like an Omu would be similar to that. Uh, if only you had a huge eight slot bag, you're right. If only there was a very awesome class, a very awesome calling that did that. This town is mostly for travelers. Pretty noisy, isn't it? Yeah. The village of Oak lies deep in the forest. The people there don't understand the language. Um, <laughs> he's just getting his squats in. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm avoiding swearing uh, because I'm going to post this on YouTube. Um, you guys can swear all you want in the chat because the YouTube video won't be able to see the chat. Uh, so don't worry about it. Um, so fun thing he mentions here in the village of Oak, the Oak is that poison forest. Um, you meet these little guys and they can't sp speak to you and you've got to get a, a spell or a stone. I can't remember. You get a thing that lets you talk to them. And that was another thing in break. It made me rem uh, this. There's a situation in Final Fantasy One where you have to learn a language to talk to people in a town. Um, those both were um, 
big things for me to learn those those were fun things to me and one of the reasons why languages in break are so important uh why yes i have played guilty gear i i i do i used to love me some guilty gear uh accent core back in the day um I played Strive for a bit because a friend had Guilty Gear Strive and Zerd, uh, and I thought they were fun, but I just I didn't get into them as much just because um, I like just haven't played fighting games for a while. But I do really like Guilty Gear quite a bit. But anyway, uh, I like I like language being in there. I turned into a Strive streamer by accident lately. <laughs> well, that's cool. Who do you main in Strive, Idolaclast? But yeah, no, um, go in here. Something you'll find. Oh, I can afford leather armor. I'm going to purchase it. No, that's all I need. Um, but yeah, languages and break are very important. Um, your character can select. You, every character knows uh, low speak speech because the Akenians weaved it into reality, which is one of the reasons why the guy who destroyed Akenia did so, because he's like, people should not be able to do that. Uh, but also, there's a bunch of other languages in the game that you can learn, and certain stuff is only in that language, so it becomes important. Uh, Soul Bad Guy, the Flames of Corruption, of course. Soul Bad Guy is a murder princess. Um, the only thing I'd say about Soul Bad Guy that doesn't work as a murder princess is his element is um, uh, fire, and it's a little hard. They don't really have like a straight-up fire thing. Uh, as a murder princess, but I'm sure if your GM was nice and let you reskin, um, you could make a pretty cool soul bad guy murder princess. Uh, so, fun fact, my favorite murder princess ability is called Vexing Dispel. And I've mentioned it before in the Discord, uh, but Vexing Dispel is a murder princess ability that lets you um, cancel out a magical ability of any kind uh, because you annoy it. If you can beat the the originator of that magical ability in a, in a uh, grit contest, essentially. That is actually based on something Soul Bad Guy did. Um, in uh, Guilty Gear Double X, uh, I know uh, the witch lady with the guitar um, uh, is uh, tricks him into killing his past self. And Therefore, he should vanish from reality, having destroyed himself, his, you know, his younger self. Um, but he just decides not to. Um, and when inquired why this didn't destroy him, he just said, eh, it's stupid. And he kind of walks off. And I thought that was the, funny, the single funniest moment of all of Guilty Gear. And I'm like, I need to give the ability to that and break. And so that's how Vexing Dispel came into effect. So yes, to make Soul Bad Guy in, in Break, you'd start with a uh, <laughs> you'd start with a murder princess, um, and you'd make sure there your um, Wrath's Blade is a uh, sort of um, master. I usually do master up, and Fire Seal is a weird weapon because uh, it's just kind of like a stump. Um, if you look at it, but I would probably make uh, start off as a, as a fire weapon, or I'm, I'm sorry, as a master weapon with fire seal, and then um, probably either take hex bolt, which is what allows you to fire blasts of magical energy, and sort of reskin that as soul bad guy's ability to shoot flames, um, and then eventually when you're able to take advanced ability, make sure you take vexing dispel. Um, it's a it's a pretty good it's a pretty good way to go. Uh, also, you have to let your GM let you play, uh, you know, any number of Guilty Gear music before uh, you do anything cool in the game. Every time you do a stunt and that kind of stuff. Um, the only thing, unfortunately, you don't have a literal super move, so you can do the dragon install. But that's you know, that's just how it goes. That said. If you play Soul Bad Guy in Break um, as a murder princess, you then are legally obligated to, to bully one of the other players into to playing a battle princess that is just Kaikisuke. Um, 
Uh, so once I convince everybody in a Pathfinder game to play Barbarians, I may have to try that with Murder Princesses. Um, yeah, he does iterate on the stump. That's true. He 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 does make more stuff. I, that's one of my favorite things about Soul Bad Guy, is that he also he's he's just this giant Dorito shaped beefcake of a man. But he's also a scientist. Man has a PhD. Several, I think, if I recall. Um, yes, Battle Princess Kai is definitely correct. You could you could technically make a bunch of Guilty Gear characters in, in Break. They just obviously wouldn't start out as Max Guilty Gear. Like, they'd start out as, like, you know, uh, limited, and then they'd have to get their Guilty Gear-ish abilities. No, no cool pirates that shoot dolphins at people yet? I'll have to work on that one. Um... Togeki. Anyway, I should probably. Um, so I'm probably going to wrap up here in a bit. Uh, but in the spirit of my character hanging out in the bar at the moment, uh, before I wrap up, I'll answer any questions anybody can think of in the next couple of minutes. What would Sin Kisuke be in break? Okay, so Sin Kisuke is actually, he's a little harder. I'd probably make Sin a champion. Um, because I think that the sort of um, sort of his sort of himboish tendencies and his sort of uh, like you know kind of uh, um, bravery before brains style of existing is pretty good for Sin. Also, if you play if you make Sin, you need to make sure to take the big eater quirk. So the big eater quirk means you have to eat twice the amount that normal people do. Uh, to be nourished uh, for journeys and stuff. But it also means that in the middle of battle, if you uh, chow down on a snack, uh, you get a heart back. Um, you can do it once for battle, obviously. And that sort of lines up with Sin's uh, kind of just his, his sort of omnivorous tendencies. So that's how I would make Sin. I'd say his weapon, uh, his sort of banner weapon, is an arc weapon. So you could probably do that, make that your favorite weapon as a champion and, and run with that. So that's how I'd make... So there you go. Um, so pause and eat a 20 cheese wheels. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's also... The Big Eater quirk is also how I would make... is something I would give to Breath of the Wild. Link. Um, that said, unfortunately, you cannot pause the game to eat all those cheese wheels. Uh, so you're going to have to figure something else there. Uh, also, good evening, Cetrifugian. Sorry you're signing on when I'm just about to end, but we're answering questions now, so if you have any, please let me know. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of other... Guilty Gear... Gosh, Guilty Gear has had such fun characters. What a what a fun... What a huge influence on... Actually, I will say Guilty Gear is another game that actually had a pretty big influence on Break. Um... Pause of the game should be a special ability option for dimensional strays. Funny you mention that. Um, Captain Captain N's belt, which is an intent NES controller, um, is a uh, was almost a relic I put in the game. But it's another thing I could not make work and still be fun. Um, were you aware you have exactly 69 followers? Nice. No, I did not. I wasn't aware, but that's pretty funny. Um, would Twilight Prince Princess Link be an Obake? Um, well, I have to put I have to put Obake in, back in the game properly for that to be the case. Uh, and I'm probably I think I mentioned this before. I'm probably gonna come up with a different name for the Obake because even as much as I like that name, I don't think it's immediately obvious what they do. Uh, with that name because it's also very heavily it's not just associated with shape changers it's also heavily associated with ghosts um that said yeah probably uh you could make twilight princess link with that because they do have uh the only problem with that is obake is a genus calling so they're both a species and a calling at once uh unlike link who is a uh you know obviously link and depending on the game is either a champion raider or a factotum um I'd say. So you could probably work something out with your GM, though. Talking about quirks, as a GM session-wise, how many do you think you would give a give for a young quirk to end? And what would you give after, after if you give something? So that one's a fun one because I think it depends on the nature of your game. 
because I'd say, for example, if you play a saga that every session happens one right after the other, um, you you really it would be a long time. You would have to play for a very long time for that young quirk to go away. That said, if for example you give a lot of time between your adventures, um, that could uh, that could really like give a lot of leeway as to when you decide to end it. Um, I would say you you probably want to play at least um, at least like maybe six to ten sessions with the young quirk before you go. Uh, before you you um, give them the option to, to get rid of it, I would say too, whenever the player wants to, because you're not really, it's not game breaking to change the young quirk. You can, you know, um, obviously it's something you can get rid of right away. And from there, I would either have them re-roll their quirk or pick a new one based on how the campaign went. Um, have a character fall into a whirlpool and come back as an older character. Uh, yes, uh, that is a reference to Final Fantasy IV, one of my favorite uh, Final Fantasies, uh, the character Rydia. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's just something. It's it's a pretty it's a pretty big one. Um, the beach that makes you old. I probably would not put the beach that makes you old. I do have a flower pet. I did put in the game the as an example a flower garden. That gives you gifts if you stay. It gives you dark or light gifts if you stay in there too long. Um, Ida class also asks, can you make Potemkin or Bedman in break? I asked, turning up the difficulty slightly. So Potemkin, yes, I would say it's pretty easy. Potemkin, I would start with either a Groon or a Promethean, um, and I would I would take a um, uh, champion and I'd give them the brawler ability because you know you want to stick to the punch thing. And then you can kind of uh, take his grapple moves, and since champions are good at stunts, you can probably use stunts to represent his sort of grapple move, his sort of grappling brawling moves. Um, it's not quite as satisfying as, you know, the sort of straight up stuff. Like you can do, you can straight up do soul bad guy and Kaikiske as battle and murder princesses, but I think it still works. Uh, Bedman would be a lot harder because Bedman isn't actually the, the character, right? It's actually his bed. Um, but if you really wanted to do that, I would say if you wanted to, you'd have to wait until I make the war mechanoid calling available. But if you wanted to take a war mechanoid and take a custrel or a specialty follower of some kind, um, you could say that follower is attached to you as the war mechanoid and that's your bed. Uh, but yeah, that would be a little hard. Also, that's kind of the character from the movie Rojan Z if you've ever seen it, which is about an old man in a life support bed, and the life support bed goes cra goes berserk and uh, smashes around town. Um, it's a good good old Mamoru Ishii, Oishi movie, if you've ever seen Akira. Uh, I think it's worth a see. It's kind of one of those anime that I think became kind of like lost to time, which is a shame because it's pretty fun. But yes, Rojin Z is what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, uh, I think, uh, oh yes, yes, War Mechanoid's going to be fun. We had to take it out because, again, we took out all the genus callings. But War Mechanoid, I think, is fun because the uh, it kind of has a mini game in it where you take abilities and the abilities are either new weapons or stuff you learned. Like, you can learn to make friends and make social bonds or you can learn to care about things besides your primary directive and that kind of stuff. Um, and so you just, you kind of choose between if you want to become more like a person or if you want to further cement your status as a weapon uh which is i think a very fun little mini game you can play um with your own character and and all the all the genus callings are like that where you have some kind of weird thing about you that makes you very different from a normal break character um i'm super interested in seeing the immortal yeah that's a good one i like that one too um Big Chopper One Piece versus Frankie One Piece vibes. Uh, probably. I'll be honest with you. I I am surprisingly unversed in One Piece in spite of a bunch of my friends being really into it. Um, but I probably would like it if I actually gave it a chance. Oh, thank you. I think it sounds cool too, Junk Goblin Junkyard. Um, 
but yeah, I, I'm I can't wait to introduce a lot of these new weird callings. I well, I am glad we stuck to the basic ones for the book, as I think it gives them room to breathe, and I think it makes the book flow better. Um, I think uh, uh, one thing I've I've really need to harp on more and point out more is that the um, the uh, the callings as they the the character creation was designed with a certain flow in mind, especially for, uh, you know, new players and people new to the game. And it sort of, he teaches you about each component of the character and it, it forms the character more and more in your mind. So uh, anyway, um, big one. I don't have enough money for the inn. Oh, that was, I have doomed myself like a fool. Um, well, this is a good enough time as any to end the stream. Uh, someone says just read some of the manga. Yeah, probably. Maybe I'll give it a chance sometime. Um, I, I've 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 had people tell me enough about it that I kind of absorbed enough of the plot points by osmosis. I think I get a, a general idea, but it is worth looking into sometime. Um, but yes, this is Crystallis. Big influence on Break. I wish I could show you more of it, but uh, I don't want to embarrass myself and die more. Um, I did get to talk a bit about, I did end up talking a long time about random break stuff. Um, Ray will start reading One Piece as preparation for a Twilight Meridian supplement, and it'll be another 10 years before it comes out. No, no, no. <coughs> if anything, if I do Twilight Meridian, I've already got lots of influences for there. Pirates of Dark Water being a big one. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I don't worry. Nothing we work on will uh, again will take ten years. We're gonna we're we're taking lots of steps to make sure our, our new stuff comes out a lot faster. Um, good stream roll, con stream Ray. Congratulations again. Good work. Looking forward to playing the game. Thank you. Um, I I would love. I can't wait till people get to play the game, and I can't wait to hear about their experiences. So, so that's one thing too. Uh, when break comes out, I want everybody to tell me about their break characters. Anyway. Um, if this goes over well, maybe I'll do another Appendix NES uh, stream uh, about a different game. Uh, I'd like to get my capture card so I can play games on, say, like my Switch and that kind of stuff, because that's what I mainly game on nowadays. Um, but yeah, thank you for showing up. I hope you all have a good evening. And uh, if you have not yet, please check out Break on Kickstarter. Uh, we have made our goal. The game is definitely happening. Um, and uh, but I, I want as many people as we can to get to get a hold of it and play. No, finish Crystallis. I'm not finishing Crystallis tonight. Thank you though. It would be super fun. Maybe I'll boot up the game I was playing on the Switch at some point uh, and get to the end and maybe stream the end of Crystallis because I think the end of Crystallis is very cool. But that's a big, big, big maybe. Um, and yes, thank you. Someone says thank you for the stream. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope you all have a great. Uh, evening. I'll be striving in a bit on here. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, if you want to drop your link in the chat, you should so that people can watch you play Guilty Gear Strive. Uh, but I, I will not be uh, striving tonight. Um, anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang a little bit here. Anyway, good night, everybody. Um, Hope you have a good time. I hope you have a good night. I think I said that three times already, but I really want you to have a good night. And yeah, uh, wait for more break. Uh, uh, stay tuned for more break. <laughs>